Patience is a virtue. Not right now it isn't. Nothing says romance like a gift of a kidnapped, injured woman. Life finds a way. So, pretty much touch anything and you get your head chopped off. I hereby christen this budget Barbie camper Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Emily. Mason. What are we doing tonight? The same thing we're doing every Friday night, Pinky. We're watching a movie. And secondarily trying to take over the world. <laughs> but tonight, which movie are we going to be watching and talking about? Well, we are going to be watching a real delight of a film called Stardust. Would that be the 1938 Stardust? No. Would that be the 1974 Stardust? No. Would that be the 1998 Stardust? No. <laughs> Would that be the 2020 <laughs> Stardust? I really am not sure. I don't remember the year. Was it 2020? No, it was 2007. 2007. Okay. Are there any years left? <laughs> there are, actually. There are quite a few <laughs> short films also named Stardust. I just found it comical that there were so many other films named Stardust that are not at all about this, obviously. They are not based on a Neil Gaiman book. Oh, it was very popular for a while, but no, this is the 2007 Stardust with our boy Charlie Cox and Aww. Claire Danes and a host of other really incredible actors and actresses. One of the things that I kind of forget about this movie is how star-studded it is, because a lot of the people that we got to know from this film have now become, of course, major actors and actresses. But people like Peter O'Toole are in this movie. Which... Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer, obviously. That white gold. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Henry Cavill is in this movie. Oh, I forgot about that. Right? I think the first time that I saw this movie, I didn't know who that was and just completely went under the radar. Yeah. And just thought like, who is that Superman looking motherfucker? Yeah. <laughs> yes. The one and only Henry Cavill. Oh, you know who else is in this movie that is a really fantastic character actor with whom we are all familiar, and that is Mark Strong. And yes. I love to see him in things. He has hair for a lot of this movie, which mm -hmm. I feel like usually his characters are bald. So I almost forget because I didn't recognize him as much, but he's great. You're right. It is so surprisingly star-studded, given that I don't feel like it is that famous. Mm -mm. I don't really remember it being promoted heavily at the time. We don't know yet. I mean, once we watch the film and we come back to do our main discussion, we will have done a lot more research. And I'm excited to kind of learn some of the background because like, how do you have all of these people in a movie and not have right. it be one of the biggest releases of the year? And maybe it was, and I just forgot. Where was I in 2007? I was in college. That was my freshman year of college. But it would have been my junior year. But yeah, we also haven't even mentioned people like Al Pacino, Ricky Gervais. <laughs> A lot of others that will come up and surprise us and that we will talk about more towards the end. Yes. Wait, hold on. Did you say Al Pacino? Was it Robert De Niro? Gosh darn it, I did. <laughs> Listen, I don't say that to be rude or to poke fun. The only reason I noticed is because I am constantly doing the same thing, which is okay. embarrassing. We do know who these people are, I swear to God. Do you want to try it again? Or start no. from somewhere? No, I don't. No. I, Let it roll. Because I'll it mess it up again. That's the problem. Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm -hmm. Vincent D'Onofrio. Oh, good one. Vincent D'Onofrio. Drea De Matteo. <laughs> Who else? This is my pitch for a movie called The Italians. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to take off. Hey, I think it'd be amazing. Everybody loves The Sopranos. Oh, true. True. Tony Soprano. Not a real person. Janine Garofalo. <laughs> oh, that's all I can think of. <laughs> Stretching here. Oh, boy. Gabagool. Gabagool. <laughs> Gabagool? Over here. <laughs> oh, goodness. Is there any Gabagool in this movie? No, there isn't. Mm -mm. There is a lot of magic. There are bathtub scenes. There are runes. Yeah, so this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about is this is an adventure movie podcast. Is it? It is, until somebody tells me otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> which could very well happen. But for the time being, it is an adventure movie podcast, and I feel like I'm on the fence about this, and we're going to okay. watch this movie, but I want to let you know in advance that I'm not sure that this will fall into the adventure movie category for me, 
even though it is a movie that I love and that I probably know nearly shot for shot and brings a smile to my face every time I think about it, that is beside the point. I'm just not sure if I will be able to put it into the adventure movie category upon viewing it through that lens. Why? Because when I think about it right now, I think of it as a fantasy film, which it is and can be both things. I know that. But one of the criteria that I've been using most recently for when an action movie kind of crosses some imaginary threshold into Adventureland is when the locations act as a character in the movie. And you don't feel like they do? I don't know. I'm trying to remember. Okay. And I remember the characters very well, and I remember the magic and everything. And I know that you get transported, and there are fantastic scenes, but is the location itself act as a character outside of any of the other characters? Okay, I'm interested to watch it with that in mind. I'm kind of surprised that that is the thing that you kind of zeroed in on, because I can see the case you're making, especially from the, if we start looping in every fantasy film, that brings in a lot of movies that are only separated from the parameters of what we're describing as adventure by stuff like, are they carrying swords? How long are the dresses? You know, like Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, like these types of things, you know, do we want to open the door to considering all epic fantasy adventure when clearly they are on an adventure? But I was expecting almost like a slippery slope argument. I'm kind of surprised actually that it was about the landscape because I also could be fixating on things I like about it, but I feel like the answer is yes. There We have all these beautiful windswept coasts. The wall is such a huge feature of it. We go from village safely protected by the wall to these amazing landscapes, very windswept moors and cliffs and all of this stuff. And then, of course, the airship. So I feel like yes, right. but I will definitely pay closer attention during this rewatch. The reason that I phrase it that way, that the landscape or the environment itself is a character, is because every movie has to be shot somewhere. Like, they all have places that they are. Except Tron. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, Tron does have actual locations. I just, listen. It was good. No, I really appreciated that. Thank you. If it helps, my brain first went to the holodeck, and then I was like, no, that's not a movie, but you know what is a movie? Tron. (laughs) Yes. Sorry, please continue. But obviously, movies have to be shot somewhere. They all have locations, but when a location goes from being where the action takes place to being a character in the story, I feel like it's hard to define, sure, but it's something that I've been on the lookout for when thinking about adventure movies. And... That's something that I'll be taking into account this time as well. What would be like a stereotypical example of this for you? Like the best example that you can think of as like location as character. So in a lot of adventure movies, I feel like when you are going somewhere, you are encountering the environment in a different way. Like it's tangible. It moves. It shifts. You know, there are Uh, traps. This would be like the mudslide in Romancing the Stone. Sure. It has its own identity as something that lives and breathes almost and not just is the place where action is taking place. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. All right. And I like it. I mean, I can think of examples too, you know, I mean, whether it's geological, geographical landscape, or whether it's like living things that are a part of the landscape. Or the craftsmanship and kind of like the art and soul that a previous generation Mm -hmm. has put into making something like they've imbued it with their own personality. If you're talking about an ancient Mayan temple that for, you know, movie purposes is always booby trapped and has some type of spikes shooting out of the walls and poison darts. But that location was kind of imbued by the people. It's not people that are doing that, but it is the location that they have given life to. You know, somebody who would make an amazing guest for the podcast would be someone who specializes in ancient booby traps. That actually is very true. Because they're real. I mean, obviously they're played up for movies and certain cultures did it a lot more than others. But for example, ancient Egypt, 
booby traps, real thing, yep. you know, grave robbers, etc. Pressurized sulfuric <laughs> gas, among other things. In the mummy, it's pressurized salt acid. Yes, salt acid. There you go. So I think it'd be really fun to actually like, what did ancient people? Well, and not just that, but the argument that the historians would be like somebody who did all this research on like ancient booby traps. And then they come to a director and the director's like, no, no, fire, just like way more fire. <laughs> Okay, Michael Bay. Yeah, like, I want arrows to shoot out of the wall. I want a big explosion that somehow got passed down through 10,000 years of... What I told all this research? You just want me to throw it away? (laughs) By seven years of my PhD, you're all for naught. Michael Bay won't listen to me. Thankfully, he tends to focus on, I don't know, machinery, I guess? Mm -hmm. Like, transformers, and so less historical detail in the filmography of Michael Bay. (laughs) But you're right. That would be an incredible guest to have on at some point. Yeah. You know what else is a really fantastic thing about this is all the brothers and the yes. progression of deaths of all of the brothers. I was going to bring that up. I wasn't sure when I was going to bring it up, but it is one of my favorite <laughs> aspects of the movie. Kind of like the fact that as soon as somebody dies, they become an onlooker and they're just like watching the story kind of like the rest of us and have been like, oh, yep. You too? Okay. Yep. Yeah, well, <laughs> come on. You know, here's a seat for you. Let's watch what happens next. See, what you don't actually know is that we have four other siblings that I murdered before you were born. Oh, hey, guys. Yep, 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 yep. It is very Gaiman, too. Like, yeah. I love Neil Gaiman. Interestingly, and I'm a big reader, as you know, mm-hmm. I have huge respect for books and that particular craft, as I do for film. A lot of times, you know, you do end up in this situation of like, well, the movie's not as good as the book. Mm -hmm. For some reason, for me personally, Neil Gaiman's work translates so well to the screen that I have read many of his books and somehow find the films and TV shows made from them a lot more compelling. And it's not that I don't like the books. American Gods in particular, I really liked. But this movie, I actually hesitate to record this because I know there are going to be people who yell at me. But I do feel like the movie Stardust is more successful than the book Stardust is at doing what it does. And I think you're right to say that that's something about Gaiman because certain things When you're trying to have narrative elements and rich, full characters and things like that, to bring them to life in a visual way, I think you're right that it was kind of just meant to be that way. Mm. So sometimes your brain kind of craves for that, even though you're reading a book, it's a very, the word is probably not cinematographical. (laughs) Visual? I mean, are you looking for visual? (laughs) Visual. Yeah, it it has a lot of visual elements. Then you're you're just like, man, (laughs) man, I would love to see this. And then you actually get to see it. And it's great. And that's one of the reasons we love this movie. I suspect that it just comes down to that Neil Gaiman has a very visual imagination. Yeah. I think the stories he crafts have naturally visual elements that translate really well to screen. And then also just the types of stories and the types of, you know, I've really been loving Sandman. I mean, I think Sandman is full of great visuals. Watched American Gods. Oh, Good Omens. I mean, how, you know, the list is just so long and like it's hit after hit after hit. I do prefer the book Good Omens. I have not read Good Omens. You should. I did prefer American Gods to the show American Gods, even though I enjoyed seeing all those characters on screen. But And that leads into or validates some of our theory of him being a very visual thinker, like when he's writing these books, he probably has a very clear image in his mind. And then once it is time for it to be translated to the screen, if he's there in the process saying like, no, this is what was in my head. Here's what we're trying to capture. Here's what I'm trying to convey. Then it's going to be you know, much more successful. And it has already the foundation of being written from a perspective of a very visual person. Yeah. And so one thing I want to ask you for this movie, are there specific moments or images that really just jump out to you? Because I have a couple for myself and it's been a little while since I watched this movie. And I'm curious to know how long it's been since you watched it. I remember the dress that she wears Mm -hmm. very strongly. I remember the cliffs and the wind and the dropping of the rune stones very strongly. Mm -hmm. I remember the brothers kind of lined up sitting on top of, yeah. So like I have images that jump out and I'm just curious as to what yours are. I really like Tristan's arc and his clothing, obviously. yes. Costumes in this are. Most of my memories are from the airship, I would say. Hmm. And 
I don't know why that is. I mean, I, of course, remember the entire movie, but the things that stand out to me are the lightning chasing scenes and... Oh, they're dancing and she's glowing. Oh my God. Yes, exactly. Ugh. The sword play and all of that. Oh, his white suit. Yeah, the white suit. The combing the hair to be longer is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The costumes in this, I'm going to do some research about the costume department because I feel like they did beautiful work. And yeah. not just with those like star pieces, but also with... I mean, Robert De Niro, Pacino's wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to live this down. You're never going to live no. that down. God, it's funny, too, because I did so much research for this, and I still got it wrong on the day of filming. You know, so, like, the Screen Actors Guild or whoever it is that tells them whose names they can't have. They get it know? wrong, too, okay. all the time. Well, no. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is, you know how, like, Emma Stone, her mm -hmm. name is Emily. She goes by Emily. They had to change it to Emma because there was already an Emily Stone in the guild or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, yes, they do that for names that are identical, but they should also do it for names that are going to be confusing for people for eternity. So somebody should have... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, like... sir. Your name is very similar to this other person's name. I'm going to need you to forfeit it. And he's like, my name is Al Pacino and his name is Robert De Niro. And yeah. you're like, yes, so similar. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody will be confused forever. So we're just going to need you to be, you know, oh, I don't know. Boy. I wonder what Al Pacino's middle name is. Can he go by that? Actually, that's a question for the audience is like, who wins in the name no. death match of Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, whose name has to change in your opinion? And I'm going to ask you that now directly. I'll put you on the spot. I'm going to guess Pacino because you defaulted to Pacino earlier. Yes. And I don't know why that is. I'm also in the middle of looking up what his middle name is. <laughs> Alfredo James Pacino is Al Pacino's Alfredo Pacino. full name. Alfredo James Pacino. Yes. Okay. I like um, it. Let's see about Robert. It kind of makes me happy that his name is Fredo. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Robert Anthony De Niro Jr. Tony and Fredo. Tony and Fredo. See, that would have been so much easier. <laughs> right? We're going to start doing that from now on when we're talking about them just to be able to keep them straight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm going De Niro in the Pacino De Niro death match. I don't want them to kill each other. I just specifically their names. I don't know. Al Pacino is just, it's so much more iconic for me and it hits harder for me. I don't know why. It's not a competition. I don't know how we got to this <laughs> point where we're making this a competition. I'm forcing you into a binary here that's a non-existent. Non I am on the Al Pacino side from a name perspective, even though I probably like Robert De Niro more as an actor. <laughs> okay, so you're a team Pacino. I'm team De Niro. I wonder if they have an X in common, because if so, that would make this story that much more compelling. I don't know. They have movies in common. Yeah. I was just particularly picturing the, like, Team Julie, Team Aniston mm, thing from back in the I 2000s. Oh, Further proof that I'm aging. Do you remember anything about when you first watched this movie? I honestly feel like it emerged, fully formed in my consciousness as yep. Athena from the head of Zeus, because I have no memory of when I would have first seen this. I just remember being like, hello, Charlie Cox. Honestly, again, another thing emerging fully formed in my head is my love of Charlie Cox. Love Daredevil, not just the show, but the character. I've always loved the moody comic book fellas, and Daredevil is my absolute favorite. I honestly don't know when, how. One of the funny things that came up a lot while I was reading about Stardust is everybody uses the phrase, then unknown Charlie Cox. So, like, <laughs> apparently nobody knew who this guy was at this point. But obviously, that's not true. And obviously, yeah. he made it in to this film and had prior experience to even be able to act at this level. But everybody has been talking about it as if nobody knew who Charlie Cox was. And it's actually funny, too, because Claire Danes gets first billing in this because mm -hmm. nobody supposedly knew who Charlie Cox was. But now we know him very well and love him very dearly. But to answer your question, I do not remember the first time I saw this. And if it came out in 2007, you know, we were both in college and not at home, not around any of the same people we had been living with for the past mm -hmm. 20 years. And so I really can't think of when I would have first been exposed to it. 
Yeah. I think it's worth pointing out to people, like, in case it seems odd to you that moving away from home would be less exposure to movies, our family growing up, our parents are big movie fans. Yes. So I think it's actually the case. Like, some people would leave and then they'd be able to do whatever they want and watch whatever they want. I don't know. We just watched a lot of movies at home. So I do sort of feel like my concentration of film watching dropped a little bit until I was out of college and had my own adult life and could do yeah. whatever I wanted. <laughs> but, the exact same thing for me. And if I graduated in 2011. It had already been out for four years. I probably saw it in college and just, it wasn't a memorable viewing, but it was a memorable movie. Yeah. And to the Claire Danes getting first billing thing, I mean, she, at this point, and still, you know, I love her, very much deserved it. I mean, she, of yeah. course, we would have known her at this point from things as early as Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. So she was very well established. Oh, absolutely. I'm just saying, since she is not considered the main character of the film, it's odd, but like that just goes to show how truly unknown this <laughs> Charlie Cox was. The unknown Charlie Cox. Yeah, but what a debut. It's so yeah. perfect for him. His little boinky dimples and like, he's so perfect for this role. I love it just profoundly. He's fantastic in this. All right, I think we should shut up and watch this movie. What do you think? Yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, I am excited to watch this movie, and so I am ready to get into it. Let's do it. I have a surprise for you. Victoria, for your hand in marriage, I'd cross oceans. You're funny, Tristan. Tristan, a shooting star! I'd cross the wall, and I'd bring you back that fallen star. You can't cross the wall. Nobody crosses the wall. Excuse me, have you seen a fallen star anywhere? We're in a crater. This must be where it fell. Yeah, this is where I fell. You're the star. You're the star? Really? Oh, wow. You've seen stories of magical worlds. <laughs> wicked witches, flying pirates, and dashing princes. <laughs> but never has there been an adventure quite like this. Everyone's talking about a fallen star. When I find out, the glory of our youth shall be restored. This is the part where you tell me who you are and why you're up here. We're just trying to make our way home. Touché. You better be telling the truth, you two-faced dog. I can get you one of them, actually. Very good guard dogs. They can watch the back and the front door at the same time. Enough. Where's the girl? You have seconds to live. Now we shall begin. Hold me tight. Think of home. Well, hello again, Mason. Hello. We are back after watching the very, very enjoyable 2007 Stardust. I love this movie. I think it's going to be very difficult to impossible to disguise how much we <laughs> love this movie. And I also was going to ask you or bring up the point that this first season is definitely chock full of movies that we already love. Yeah. And it's not really going to challenge <laughs> our opinions or thoughts too much. It's kind of a love letter, I think, to a lot of these movies. And I think that's totally fine. But yeah, after watching this, I'm so happy that we chose it for this first season. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, I think we did, you know, like we said with The Mummy, kind of softball ourselves a little bit. I mean, there are a few thrown in that one or the other of us hasn't seen. There's one I know for a fact that we both haven't seen. So we have right. challenged ourselves a bit, but this is another one that is a true favorite. And like you said, I think it's going to shine through how much we just really love it. And there are criticisms you can make, of course. Honestly, like I'll just drop at the beginning. There are some plot holes. There are some inconsistencies. If you go <laughs> on IMDb, the trivia facts are basically all continuity errors, but you don't notice them because you're so yep. emotionally invested in the movie. Charmed, I think. You're just charmed kind of by the tone of it. So, I mean, why dwell on that stuff? It's a lovely film full of just absolutely delightful shit. So, like, why would I fixate on the fact that her bow is tied on a different side? We definitely don't want the tone of this podcast to be something where we're trying to nitpick or trying to find those things. And suspension of disbelief is a very real concept that we... <laughs> yeah, benefit from, you know? Benefit from, right. And so I'm definitely not going to harp on those things. Yeah. I mean, you know, if that's your deal, it's probably not the right podcast for you. I mean, you know, I, it's fun to talk about sometimes if something's really glaring. But like you said, if it doesn't take you out of it, you know, what do I care? 
Mm-hmm. Segue, by the way, professional segue happening currently. It certainly didn't hurt the movie's performance. It's not what anybody would maybe call a blockbuster. And I've even found it on some lists of flops, but I don't think that's fully warranted. It had a budget of $70 million. It made 137 and a half at Worldwide Box. I would not consider that a flop. Me neither. I mean, it made back almost twice its money. I will say it did not get what it deserved in terms of ticket sales or recognition. I mean, the people that it has in it, how do you not? I mean, I watched an episode of Cinema Therapy on YouTube in preparation for this, and they were comparing it to Prince Sprite. You know, just in terms of Mm. like, Mm -hmm. it should have gotten that kind of love. It should have been that kind of romantic touchstone kind of for a generation where like we can quote it. And I get where they're coming from, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think we were joking during the movie because people kept appearing that we forgot were in the movie. And we were just like, man, how did they get all of these heavy hitters? And then my assumption was, you know, oh, they just sent the script out to everybody. Literally that they, every person in Hollywood. Literally every person <laughs> and every single person was like, yes, I'm in. I'll play whatever you want me to play. It does not matter which role. I love it. And so like, that's how they got all these wonderful actors in some pretty lesser roles. Yeah. I mean, Peter O'Toole, Ian McKellen, yep. obviously Robert De Niro, Michelle Pfeiffer, Rupert Everett. And, you know, I do have some interesting casting stories about some of these people. So okay. it isn't as scattershot as that. They actually did, particularly with Robert De Niro, Matthew Vaughn just wanted him. They were talking about casting. He was like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could get Robert De Niro? Ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he actually laughed as like as a joke. Unless. <laughs> Unless. <laughs> exactly. And so they reached out. They had a meeting and he was up for it. That's awesome. And. I think he said the same thing happened with Michelle Pfeiffer, where they were thinking, who can play this? Who is famous enough for being beautiful that as she is falling apart, we can believe that she would be this invested in regaining her beauty. And he was like, I don't know, Michelle Pfeiffer. Ha 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 ha. (laughs) You know, and then they got her. So I think they got very lucky with casting just in terms of getting who they wanted. And that, you know, is a part of the joy of it. And like Rupert Everett is one of those two where he said we had to cast somebody as famous as Rupert so that when we threw him out of the window in the first 30 seconds, (laughs) you know, people would be surprised. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Which, of course, you know, that was very effective. Mm -hmm. But speaking of the beginning of the movie, I mentioned this to you by text, but I have written a plot summary. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear it. I'm very excited. (laughs) As I understand, it is full of humor. We'll laugh, we'll cry. (laughs) Okay, fine. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll <laughs> learn lessons. No, basically, like, I was going to pull just the IMDb description or something really basic, and I was just really not satisfied, so I decided to write my own. That is kind of something that we've, I think, both been critical of as we've done research <laughs> for movies, is like, okay, yeah, this is technically correct, but it's kind of soulless, or... Yeah. Or sometimes they're not technically correct, and I'm like, that is or, not... Or, yeah, what... they're just not technically <laughs> correct, and so we feel like we can do... Better? Not necessarily a better job. But I know like, I can do a better job. <laughs> but we feel like we can at least impart some of the character of the movie into the description yes. as well. Because, yeah, going point by point through a movie doesn't always do it justice, but it sounds like you have prepared a little bit more than that. So I'd love to hear it. Okay. Well, I'm going to read it. I hope it is not too long. If it is too long, <laughs> maybe Lance can cut out some of it. Yep. For the audience, I don't remember if we've mentioned Lance in a main episode. He is the editor of this podcast. Hello. And makes us sound better than we deserve. Oh, yes. Plot summary of Stardust. In an English town called Wall, a young man named Tristan is obsessed with a pretty asshole named Victoria. (laughs) (laughs) He's fighting a very uphill battle to woo her away from Humphrey, her male equivalent. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I like where this is going already. In a last-ditch effort, Tristan promises her to track down a shooting star they see and give it to her for her birthday in exchange for her hand in marriage. One problem. Wall is located adjacent to a stone wall guarding a magical kingdom named Stormholt, where the star has fallen and no one from England may cross it. As Tristan prepares to leave on this journey, his dad tells him a secret, that he crossed the wall himself as a young man and met Tristan's mother, Una, a girl he met at a market enslaved to a witch named Ditchwater Sal, who, by the way, sidebar, Every time I watch this movie, I think it's dishwater, Sal. Mm -hmm. Both dirty and gross. Sal wouldn't let her keep baby Tristan, so she deposited him on his dad's doorstep with a note and a Babylon candle, allowing Tristan to travel anywhere by candlelight. He lights it, intending to think of his mom, but whoops, dumb Victoria, and the star pop into his head. And before we know it, he lands on Claire Danes. It's very much like Diagonelli. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Think of the right place, you're fine. (laughs) It is, it is. But Dumb not the right place, and you land on Claire Danes, which honestly sounds like a dream. <laughs> Much <scenario>. better. <laughs> dream yeah. Scenario. Okay. 
Well, she's a star named Evane, and Tristan isn't the only one looking for her. A group of witches led by Michelle Pfeiffer want to eat her heart to regain their youth and magic, and the surviving princes of Stormhold are on her tail too. It's a very relatable story. <laughs> I feel like we've all been Who am at I that asked, point right? trying to regain our youth by eating, you know, a poor girl's heart. But yeah. sorry, continue, please. But not all of us do it, is what I'm saying. Yes, that is true. Okay. Michelle Pfeiffer sets a trap in the form of a cozy inn, and she almost gets Evane's heart via a hot bath and a massage. Relatable. But Tristan makes it there in time, and they escape by using up the last of the Babylon candle. They get picked up by a group of lightning pirates led by Robert De Niro as Captain Shakespeare. He acts rough, but really he just wants to talk about England and give them both makeovers, leading to the greatest hair transformation on film. <laughs> the pirates keep them safe and teach them to sword fight, dance, and play the piano. We get one of the more enjoyable montages on film and watch Yvain open up and start to glow more, especially when she's near Tristan and his new amazing hair. Yes. These transformations also happen in a remarkably short amount of time. <laughs> We were discussing this, that we went back and we tried to do the math on, like, how long were they actually on the ship? Because, you know, Tristan learns to sword fight, Vane learns to play the piano, there are makeovers, there's hair, there's, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, no, I think they were on there for four days. Yeah. And it's like, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> they got very good, very fast. And then we looked up some explanations for what was going on and if it was different in the book or anything. And they were like, no, not really. We just all assumed that Captain Shakespeare was a really good teacher. And that's why Tristan was able to learn sword fighting in like four days. Yeah. So I mean, sure. Why not? Shakespeare drops them off and they continue to make their way toward Wall, having some flirty moments along the way. They hitch a ride with Dishwater Sal, who has been cursed by Michelle Pfeiffer, so she can't see Yvonne at all. Thinking Tristan is the only one asking for a ride, she turns him into a mouse to transport him to the market town near the Wall. Along the way, thinking that Mouse Tristan can't understand her, Yvonne confesses her feelings. When they do get to Wall and find a hotel room, he lets her know that he feels the same way, and they spend what must have been a very glowy night together. <laughs> In the morning, the day of Victoria's birthday, Tristan leaves a message for Yvonne with the unreliable innkeeper, and goes to deliver a lock of her hair as a token, and tell Victoria that she's the worst. When the hair turns to stardust, he races back to tell Yvonne that she can't cross the wall. But Yvain has misunderstood his message and gone off on her own, only to be kidnapped by Michelle Pfeiffer. Mark Strong isn't far behind, but neither is Tristan. They manage to kill Michelle Pfeiffer's sisters, but she kills Mark Strong and then uses him as a meat puppet to fight Tristan. She tries a fake-out to get Yvain's heart glowing again, but then Yvain shines her very hardest and blows up Michelle Pfeiffer. Tristan is now the last male heir of Stormhold, and he and Yvain become king and queen, ruling for 80 years before using a Babylon candle to return to the sky as stars. And feed. True. We kind of glossed over some of the family dynamics. Well, I had to skip. Oh, yeah, it used yeah, yeah. To be yeah. No, more uh, no. than a thousand words for the audience. <laughs> I had to cut out some things. <laughs> no, I'm not saying like your thing should have included this. Just to go back, Una, for a long period of the film, we don't know is related to these brothers that are fighting for yes. the crown. And only towards the end is it revealed that Tristan's mother is Una. We know that Tristan's yes. mother is True. this person, but then we find out that that person is Una, who is the lost sister, and therefore he is the only remaining male heir to the throne, even though we both think that Una would have made a great female heir. She's clearly very resilient. I also entirely skipped some of my favorite stuff, really, which is Captain Shakespeare and his crew, their dynamics. Oh, yes. And then, of course, Mark Strong finding them and fighting with them on the boat and all of that stuff. Yeah, we do have some great dynamics, some great character performances. Since we have so many big names in this movie, who for you had, I guess, the best performance or who stole the scene or, you know, who may have stolen your heart in the process? <laughs> oh, Lord. I mean, Charlie Cox stole my heart. Mark Strong stole the scene. Michelle Pfeiffer is all that anyone wants to look at when she's on screen. Mm-hmm. Robert De Niro dancing around in a corset with a little heart painted on his face, which for listeners, I have done to my face now. We also both really appreciated Nathaniel Parker as yes, Dunstan. Dunstan. Oh. Older Dunstan. We yeah. get two versions of Dunstan. Oh, and then we get Ben Barnes as baby Dunstan. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Like, that's the first scene of the movie, basically, is Ben Barnes. He's only in the movie for, like, I that know. one scene. he goes away. Why would anyone make a movie where Ben Barnes goes away? <laughs> yes. I mean that. But he turns into a great older Dunstan, yeah. played by Thank Nathaniel God. Parker. So we really enjoyed Nathaniel Parker's role there, being just, like, the supportive dad who treats his son like... Such a good daddy. 
like he knows that the adult he is going to be is a beautiful, wonderful person, yeah. and he's just there to nurture that. And so we both really, really appreciated that. And oh yeah, when it comes time for him to cross the wall, you know, he's like, okay, here's what's going to happen. I did the same thing. That's how I met your mother. And <laughs> that's actually the end of here. how I met your mother. <laughs> <laughs> they cross the wall. And then, yeah, he is. He's delightful. And he's so warm and wonderful. And it led us to look him up during our watch. And then I learned an amazing fact about him, which is that his real life dad's name is Sir Peter Parker. Yes. So... That's cool. Somebody comes up to him and he's like, Mr. Parker? And he's like, no, Spider-Man was my father. <laughs> <laughs> my dad is the English Spider-Man. Well, and, you yeah. know, not to shortchange his mom, Dr. Jill Parker. So his mom mm -hmm. is a doctor and his dad is the Sir Peter Parker. And I mean, I would like to imagine that his warmth as a father figure perhaps came from his good parenting, but that is so fully projection. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. very aware of that, <laughs> but I like it. Oh, Mark Williams as yep. Billy the Goat. Billy the Goat. Right. <laughs> Bernard, the kid who plays Bernard. Another role that makes me have this feeling that they sent the script out and literally everyone <laughs> that got the script wanted to be involved in any way, shape, or form. And Mark Williams showing up as a transfigured goat into a human. Sure, I'd play that. There are just a lot of really fantastic character actors for future bases in this he's not my personal mm -hmm. favorite but like he does a good job i think this is a good use of his skills this role mm -hmm. is it's a good fit for him and he and de niro have some fun moments one of the things i asked during our watch was like how much of this is improv because it feels like ricky gervais improv -ing. and the answer is yes he did they yeah. weren't able to use a lot of it because apparently they were just going so far off plot that like a lot of it just didn't fit in, but a lot of it did, including the line he has about being a ventriloquist dummy. Like, well, I didn't say that. So if you heard it, you must be a ventriloquist. <laughs> so I think he was well used. Yeah. I feel like whenever you release Ricky Gervais on a film, <laughs> it has to be <laughs> the expectation that he's just going to be Ricky Gervais. He's just going to do all of that improv. That is the correct way to put it. When you release <laughs> Ricky Gervais on a film. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, another thing too, I can't overstate this for me personally as a viewer. I love the locations. They shot on the Isle of Skye and in Iceland. That shot where Mark Strong is on the beach and there's a bunch of sea ice, that is in Iceland. They had to also shoot on the Isle of Skye because you can't actually take animals into Iceland to shoot. So a lot of the shots where it's just this big epic landscape and a person, those they did shoot in Iceland. The Isle of Skye is actually a similar landscape. It's a similar like volcanic island that mm -hmm. basically ripped off of the same whatever geology so <laughs> it doubles. i just like that it ripped off this other country's geology landmass uh, no <laughs> the original <laughs> not a metaphorical rip off like it actually ripped off of it but yeah, yeah another great podcast guest geology I actually used to live next to two geologists who are married to each other and they would be tremendously fun to have on mm -hmm. just, you know sidebar geology couples have competing rock collections Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Now I know. Okay. Anyway, so those locations are so stunning. And interestingly, Neil Gaiman actually had a home on the Isle of Skye at the time, not connected to the filming, but he just was living there. And they were like, hey, we're going to shoot here. And he was like, cool, I'll be over here. Yeah. During the film, we were wondering how much Neil Gaiman was involved. And Emily, I think you looked up and he's typically very involved in the adaptations of his books, which... I think does them great justice and is part of the reason why when you, the viewer, are seeing this very rich world come to life, it's because he is saying, this is exactly how it was in my head. And it's also part of the reason potentially why, you know, you like the movie more than the book, because he's a very visual thinker and visual writer and is able to then impart that or imbue the film yeah. with that based on him being very closely tied to it and involved. So I uh, follow him on Tumblr because I'm a cool kid. And another thing that I think makes him a good collaborator for filmmakers is he's open to changes that facilitate the story. Mm. They did have to make some changes from the book for this. He, as far as I understand, was involved in making those decisions. I mean, some authors can be so driven to control their work that they don't allow it to be adapted in the best possible way. And I think he's very good about that. So Speaking of collaboration, another thing that contributed to the quality of this film, I think, is that Matthew Vaughn 
in addition to directing the film, co-wrote the script with Jane mm. Goldman, who he has collaborated with a ton. He also brought on a lot of his longtime crew that he's worked with on a number of smaller films, even though Paramount offered to bring in a big DP and other key roles, he pushed to retain this group of crew that he was extremely comfortable working with and they were comfortable with each other. And a number of people at all these different levels have worked with him before. And I think you can see that because there are little bits and pieces of things that, you know, maybe you could pick at. But in terms of cohesive tone, it's so enjoyable to watch start to finish. It's eccentric without being overdone or weird. I would like to attribute some of that to this sort of core team that yeah. has worked together before. And I'm glad, I mean, you said that Paramount offered for a different group to be brought in. I'm also glad that they were supportive of the alternate decision, which was to, you know, use these people that were very familiar yeah. with the directors. So, yeah, I didn't check to see about the film editors. I would be very curious to look up whether those people fell under that, because I think the editing in this movie is great. I mean, it's not seamless. There are a number of shots where somebody didn't catch a continuity error, and I don't know if that was an editing or if that was the, what is it, line editor or the script? So somebody's responsible for that. I don't know. No, there is actually a role in many films that is specific to continuity. What is it called? It is like a continuity director. It's something similar to that, where it is their job entirely to take care of that, right. to remember kind of like the previous state that you were in before you go back into another shoot or a reshoot. And I used to know what it was called, and I can't remember. But you Yeah, know, like, I did too. I mean, yeah. whatever. The point is, I think the editing is expressive and funny. There are so many great moments that you can attribute to good editing. So it's mm -hmm. not that I can't nitpick. It's more that part of editing that I care about, which is like, how is the editing contributing to the storytelling? I think they did really beautifully. Right. There are two really good examples. One that we called out explicitly during our watch of it, which is the mouse love confession. The <laughs> yes. like pacing of giving her these long <laughs> monologues in her face. And then we cut to the mouse at like exactly yep. the right moments. Yes. That's a really good example. And then I also really love the father I lost my job sequence. Mm. and how that's mm. edited. They prelap the audio of him saying, Father, I lost my job over like the very end of the scene of him leaving. And then, of course, you get those practice moments and then you get his father walking in and cutting in and saying, oh, you lost your job. Mm -hmm. That sequence is really <laughs> well edited. And so for me, both of those are just moments where the editing just really adds a lot. In addition to the ones you've called out already, one of the ones that always makes me laugh is when we get to meet the unicorn <laughs> that is really one of the real heroes of the film Absolutely. in terms of impact. But speaking of impact, there is a scene where Mark Williams, as Mark Williams, runs headlong into this <laughs> unicorn and the unicorn who has kind of like magic dispelling abilities. Yes. It knocked the magic right out of him. It knocked the magic right out of him and he went back to being a goat and it is the funniest thing. It's something where it's like a guilty laugh because <laughs> obviously I don't want goats to be hurled backwards into walls or anything like that. But Mason is anti-goat. Mark me. Oh, jeez. I love goats actually. Yeah. <laughs> do they have the little weird pupils like sheep do? Yeah, they do, don't they? I don't know. Don't they? I don't think I've ever met a goat. Googleable. Yeah, that's a great moment as well. Yeah, they do. Oh, okay. Confirmed. Okay. Anyway, so we we noticed in the film, yes, that the unicorn is a big part of the story, and we were also thinking about how unicorns are portrayed in other films and things like that. And I'm going to be on the lookout for that. Like the more movies we watch together, the more I'm going to be looking towards how unicorns are portrayed, because in this one, they are very strong, individualistic, like she's talking to the unicorn, she's mm -hmm. using that unicorn as a confidant or whatever. She's treating it as a peer. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's one we'll keep an eye on for the future. You know, we haven't talked enough about Charlie Cox yet. I mean, we did, of okay. course, a little bit that like, this was a very early role for him. Speaking of which, I have two things that I want to say. Okay. One is that I found a clip of him doing press for this, and it was his first Ooh. time doing press for a movie. And oh, my goodness. He looked so emo. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> I'm going to put a picture of it on the Instagram. It's like emo Charlie Cox with like the full on like dashboard confessional hair. And like he's got this little earring and he's wearing like layered band t-shirt. Like it is the oh, cutest man. thing. <laughs> 
And I never knew that, that he had his emo moment. But anyway, Matthew Vaughn was very dead set on Charlie from very early on. Apparently, hmm. Charlie Cox was out to dinner with his agent and they actually ran into Vaughn carrying the novel before he had adapted it. Hmm. So that was just kind of a funny accident. And he did, of course, audition, and so did many others. But apparently kind of from that first audition, he was like, oh, yeah, we need this kid. And Jane Goldman, the collaborator that I mentioned, she said, we auditioned a lot of people who had a more world-weary kind of, I can't remember her exact word, but it was basically like sarcastic approach to the character. And it didn't work. You need that like wholehearted, earnest thing in order to make this character work. He's so open to the world and so excited about going on an adventure. And it comes from a place of appreciation and aspiration and love and warmth. Yeah. And I mean, we both were able to see that, I think, in their smiles and the way that they look at each other. I like to think of it as the smile is able to show that they are willing to be hurt for love. Or maybe that's the wrong way to put it. But basically, there's some vulnerability there to opening yourself up to these things. And yes, if you're world weary, you're going to hold your cards close to your chest. You're not going to be as open with people. But like these characters are so full of life, full of willingness and openness and love that it really does show through in their smiles. And, you know, that's a good point, too, because that's something that they have in common that they don't share with other characters in the story, which is he is on his first foray into the world, basically. Mm -hmm. And so is she. She literally dropped out of the sky. So they meet at a time when she has been watching a world she hasn't been taking part in. And he has been dreaming about a world that he hasn't had a chance to take a part in. Right. And they meet at the beginning of that journey together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she brings wisdom and 400 million years of experience or whatever it is, but she's never actually done it. And neither has he, he's just been dreaming about it. Right. The character of Yvain, though, does mention, as she's been observing the earth, one thing that humans do really well is love. However, I feel like that still shows kind of her character. Because if you're looking down on the world and you're looking for good, you will see good. If you're looking for all the broken relationships, you'll see that. You know, if you see how people hurt people, that could be where you are when you meet somebody for the first time. But she's not. You know, she is looking at the positive side rather than the negative. And that means that they can have that type of relationship and that she can shine metaphorically and physically in that relationship. I mean, and, you know, Tristan could have done the same thing. I mean, he's living in a town where he is not rich or considered the most handsome, (laughs) which is ridiculous. (laughs) But Okay, his haircut, though, at the beginning. Fair. Somebody did him dirty with that haircut. They did. They did. They did that on purpose. Yeah. It's the Oded Fair problem is, like, you're going to have to work really hard to make this person not attractive. (laughs) Yes. But he could be like, yeah, I get bullied. Yeah, the girl I like is into this other guy. But they both retain that openness and optimism, I guess. I don't know. I guess when she drops out of the sky, I don't really think of her as optimistic exactly. She's guarding it more. She is a bit pissed (laughs) that somebody hit her with a necklace. That's the best. She is snarky from moment one, and I love it. Yes. Well, I also think it's funny that she just expected him to understand that she was a star. To be fair, she was laying in a crater. (laughs) She was... Okay. (laughs) You're not wrong. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, if you came across a woman lying in a crater, would you be like, hey, I bet you made this crater? Probably not. No. But that sounds like a really awful way to talk to a woman for the first time, actually. (laughs) Hey, baby. Yeah, you're in a crater. (laughs) You're lying in this crater. Do you make this? (laughs) Hey, baby. Are you a star? Because I see here you've made a crater. (laughs) (laughs) This is our quality of pickup lines. It's good that we both have partners already. I... (laughs) Oh, you know, another thing that came up while we were watching the movie, Peter O'Toole is so old. It's true. I'm very glad to have him in the movie, but he looks barely alive. And yet we looked up because we were speculating, like, this has got to be like his last project, right? Because he literally looks like he's about to die. And I say this, by the way, as someone who loves him. Can we stop for a second, though, and say that Peter O'Toole was meant to look like he was about to die. Ah! That was his role in the movie. His role in the movie was to look like he was about to die. But he does look pretty old. You know what? That's an excellent point. But we did look up how many more projects he made after this before he did pass in 2013. And the answer is seven. He made seven more Mm -hmm. films and TV series. I think one of them was a TV series. Seven more. 
he was a million and he made seven more projects. So it's a testament to his longevity as an actor. So how do you feel about Sienna Miller in this? I think that she played the role well. Yeah. But it's one of those things where it's hard to be objective about a character that you don't like. Because we both agree that Tristan was way too good for her and everything. But it is difficult to be objective about somebody you don't like. Yeah. And the character I did not like. But I think that it does take a special talent to play a character that people don't like kind of universally. So even though she is very pretty, being able to see kind of the shallowness of her come through and us all be rooting for like, no, buddy, no, Ugh. no, no, yeah. buddy. No, not this. No, come on, buddy. All throughout that first part, we were both just like, no, I don't want you to yeah. end up with her. How did that ever happen? How did you get it in your head that this is the peak of relationships? Small town. <laughs> Well, yeah, Very but th she only ever uses yeah. him, and we see that on multiple occasions, and she sucks. she's really looking for somebody to, I don't know, enable her to be the way that she is. The whole, you know, I'm looking for a wealthy person or someone that's willing to go to Ipswich for me to get a ring, all of that stuff. All the way to Ipswich. All the way to Ipswich, yes. Kind of shows that she is in a bad place or in the wrong place. She's just sort of the basic pretty girl. She's very pretty. End of sentence. But this kind of is a good segue into one of my favorite moments in the film, is which is when Tristan and Yvain have gotten picked up by the lightning pirates, and they're still tied up, and they're having a conversation, and Yvain says, tell me about Victoria, and he can't think of anything. <laughs> He's like, well, I've, uh, yeah. I've said everything. And then she makes this little face that's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that moment oh, so know. much of like, and now you're seeing. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was actually, he was talking about all these things he's done for Victoria. And she says, well, what yeah, has Victoria done for you? Yeah. And he can't think of a single thing because she doesn't. She has never given anything to the relationship. Because she doesn't see it as a relationship. But I love that moment too of like Yvain being like, hey, you have just as much right to be essentially wooed, you know, as she mm -hmm. does. And the fact that it doesn't occur to him that he might deserve that as well kind of speaks to his self-image and his self-confidence. And it's such a feminist moment, really. And I just love mm -hmm. it so much of being like, hey, you deserve that too, you know? Your role is not to just win the girl. The girl isn't an icon. She's a human woman who should also love you, and care yeah. about you, and want the best for you, you know? Absolutely. So we talked a bit in the film, too, about Henry Cavill showing up kind of randomly. And we were both surprised just because of kind of the mythos that surrounds him now versus where he was at the time. <laughs> and I think in terms of hateable characters, he checks pretty much every box. Also, his hair is fake and, you know, he's Blonde. just an ass, but very hateable. And at the very end of the movie, they are shown as being together. Victoria and Humphrey Humphrey are shown as being together at Tristan and Evane's coronation. And <laughs> it was just kind of like the perfect, they deserve each other. And they both got invited to this <laughs> castle on a mountaintop in Stormhold. I know. I can't decide what I think is funnier, that Tristan and Yvain spite invited them or that they came. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it is great that they're there, though. We haven't spent much time on the boat, and I think that's both of our favorite part of the movie. And one thing yeah. I wanted to mention that I did find out, so we were wondering, I think actually during our watch of it, we were talking about, you know, you come in as Robert De Niro and you're just like, why would I do a British accent? This is better. This is mine. Actually, that was a directorial decision. Mm. Yeah. Vaughn was like, I think we're going to keep a New York accent. So <laughs> yeah, I thought that was kind of a funny thing, but if that was at his level. He was just like, hey, this is better. This is funnier. And he's right. <laughs> yep. I agree. I had read somewhere that he was supposed to be from England, but then when we were watching it, it's actually not the case. He just is kind of in love with the city yeah. of London and asks about it, but... He's an Anglophone. I agree that it was much better to keep him with the New York accent. Oh, yeah. He is so delightful in this. And I will say, I do think he overdoes it a bit, or possibly Vaughn had him overdoing it a little bit, but just like a little bit. And mostly, it is just so delightful. He's a very lovable character. Oh, yeah. He wants to be tough. 
he wants to be seen as tough, but really he just wants to talk about England and dress up and do people's hair. But when he needs to be the captain, he can be the captain. That moment, like after they drop Septimus slash Mark Strong off the boat or he jumps off the boat or whatever it is, and they come in there and check on him. And he's there with his little heart painted on his face and his beard and his corset. He's sitting there. He still has the like full posture of a captain and the Mm -hmm. vibe. And I don't remember exactly what he says, but basically they're like, we know and we love you. And then he just goes, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) it is a very funny scene. We always knew you were a whoopsie. Yeah, that one. And then he just push him to the back. Like, yeah, everybody pushes him to the back. But it is really one of the most wholesome yeah. relationships, you know, is the captain to crew, like where they all love him so much. And, you know, OK, sure, we live in a world in which reputation matters a lot for these types of things. And so, you know, they're willing to protect that reputation for him. But clearly they still love him for who he is. And like, that's such a beautiful yeah. thing. And to have it affirmed there, you know, where he wasn't sure if they would accept him as himself, because he's also been protecting himself from them to an extent. Yeah. But they saw him still and embraced him, you know, in that way. It really is excellent. And then Mark Strong's character does even call out, like, ooh, this is the fearsome yep. Captain Shakespeare. You know, his reputation precedes him. So it clearly, like, it was working on the outside. And, you know, these men were helping to defend that reputation, but truly just loved him for who he Everybody is. Everybody deserves to dress up and just dance around a little bit if they want to. Mm-hmm. I agree. Like you said, it's a very wholesome relationship. And I really particularly love the guy who plays his first mate because he's always just sort of like Mm -hmm. rolling his eyes at the captain's need to hide it. And early in the movie, you think that he is the only one who knows and that the rest of the crew doesn't know. But at the end there, of course, we find out that they knew all along. And so he's sort of over there rolling his eyes because he's like, oh, my God, they already know. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. you know, but his facial expressions, that guy is just they're so great. He's one of my favorite little minor characters. He just does a fantastic job. Oh, he's someone I would enjoy getting on the podcast. (laughs) Speaking of minor characters, I know that you called out one of the brothers that we don't see their death on screen, but all these brothers, one of the most fantastic things about the film is that they continue to show up throughout and, you know, are kind of watching the action unfold. And one of the brothers who appears to have been frozen to death (laughs) is Julian Ryan Tut. Yes who will make another appearance on this podcast. Next episode, no less. Next episode. So we've got a tie-in already. Yes. But yes, he will return as Mr. Pims. Mr. Pims, like the beverage. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, he is really fun to watch, honestly. He is. Actually, in The Princess, too, are a lot of great character actors in that list. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, gosh, I almost have his name. It's Fleming. Jason Fleming. Jason Fleming. Yeah, he's in a lot of great stuff. I mean, really, you just have just a massive cast. (laughs) Just a massive Mm -hmm. cast. And I love Mark Strong so much. It's always great to see him in things. He is just really talented, you know? And he's always, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say in the background. I would say he's extremely comfortable as, like, star supporting cast. Mm -hmm. Like, he'll be that set piece supporting person who, like, has a lot of attention, has a really important role. I'm trying to think of if I've seen him be like the main lead in things, but whatever he's in, he is so noticeable and he acts so well. <laughs> like he's just really good. Yeah, I just I imagine you meeting him at a convention or something. <laughs> hey, um, I don't know all of what you've been in or if you've been like a lead actor, but you act real good. I gotta go. <laughs> Can I rub your head first? <laughs> you wanna see me be a dork? Watch me beat Mark Strong and just giggle my way through it. I'm trying to find that name of that actor because I really feel like I should credit the first mate for being Dexter Fletcher. And he's only credited as Oh, that's a great skinny name. pirate. No, bro. He's gotta be at least like the first mate. But that is a fantastic name for a human being. Yes. Dexter Fletcher. Whew. So, Dex, if you wanna come on the cast. <sighs> I won't even try for Mark Strong because I would melt. (laughs) Oh, one thing that I did want to point out, and this is kind of, I don't know, minor, but for the hair and makeup dorks among us, the hair and makeup designer for this film was Faye Hammond, who also did Pride and Prejudice. So knows a thing or two about beautiful, swoopy male hair. It's so funny because I found that out after noticing that there's a scene when Tristan is coming to make sure that Evane doesn't cross the wall, I think is when it is. And he's just like striding across this meadow in his coat and his hair is going. And I'm like, oh, that's like some shots in Pride and Prejudice. And then I found this later and I was like, aha, connection. Very, very interesting. 
British men striding across meadows. <laughs> also, speaking of Tristan's hair, it's nice to see a man makeover that makes him feel more like himself. I feel like a lot of times when you see man makeovers on film, it's more like a girl dressing some guy up to make him less like himself and more like she wants. And it's nice to see Tristan's glow up as making him feel better about himself, making him feel more like himself. Right. Well, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, too, because the person that is enabling this makeover is somebody who does know yeah. his true self and embraces it. And he is able to see, I think, Tristan in a way that other people haven't seen him. And it goes also beyond that to when he gives Tristan advice about Yvain, yeah. saying, hey, the love you've been seeking is right before you. Yeah. You know, he sees through these things. And I think that enables him to really help shape Tristan's image to match his true self. And in that way, it kind of ties back to Dunstan and the whole father figure thing of like seeing the person inside you. And he has a very fatherly energy with the two of them, other than the parts where he has to pretend like he wants to have sex with a baby. <laughs> like there's some awkward moments where you're like, we don't need to pretend this. There are. But I mean, if you look back on those scenes where it's kind of awkward and, you know, where there's this machismo dynamic. That's where we get the eye roll from Dex. It's really just a misunderstanding of both sides yeah. being like, oh, this side wants me to act like a man. And the other side is like, ooh, we need to help him think that we don't know about his <laughs> yeah. dressing up. You know, like, let's both do this back and forth. And so all of those things, even though they are for show, like they still in the end can be wholesome and yeah. Not, yeah. not about the actual thing. Yeah, not threatening. It's just a misunderstanding on both sides. And you just assume that the other side wants or needs you to behave a certain way. They're both acting for each other. Like, and it's an act yeah. on both sides, which is kind of funny. Exactly. And it's its own humor, exactly. too. But the boat, like, one thing we talked about a little bit is just, like, this montage is so much fun. A lot of times montages are either a bit cheesy or you tune out or they can be lazy filmmaking. Mm -hmm. But I really enjoy this one. This is one of my favorite montages ever. And watching her glow and watching them yeah. really see each other. It's a montage of a lot of things. Falling in love, yes. gaining skills, being more your true self, making friends, you know? <laughs> like it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's really nice. Learning to play three notes on a piano. Da, da, da. Yeah. There wasn't much time, you know, three notes is all you can really ask for. Yeah. And it's not a long section of the film, but it's one of my favorite parts of the movie. Right. It's not long, but it encompasses a lot of the transformation of the characters and bringing them into their own. Yeah. And I think we're both probably suckers for a good montage, you know, <laughs> especially when it is like character development yeah. and, you know, these people realizing that they really do enjoy each other and love each other. And, uh... and I think we're still in that first blush of like how good Tristan's hair looks. <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot happening really once we get the Tristan revealed there's nothing much else I'm focused on in the film <laughs> that's totally fair so after they leave the ship we get back on the road I really love the shot as they're walking away from the boat and the coloration of that kind of gets us back into like oh wait I forgot about all these amazing landscapes and so they're back on the road we get that moment where they have to dive into the bushes and the are you tempted scene and we talked about that a bit too because speaking of misunderstandings she is flirting but when she says tempted she's meaning you know to cut out her heart and eat it and <laughs> and he has this moment where he's realizing he is tempted but then she clarifies what she means and he's like oh <laughs> no <laughs> like <laughs> and then the same thing happens the other way around and he points out like well wouldn't it be lonely to be immortal and maybe not so much if you were with someone you loved and then her glow goes down because we suspect she thinks he means victoria Mm -hmm. But maybe he's just actually pondering the temptation that he is actually feeling. And, of course, what the captain has just said to him. So it's a moment. And then they come across Fishwater Saligan. <laughs> I didn't have a good segue for that one. <laughs> yeah, then they come across Fishwater Saligan. I don't either, because the next thing I have written down is, what kind of bird is his mom? <laughs> and I have an answer. Yes. Oh, do she you? She is a white-throated magpie jay. Oh, interesting. I know a lot about magpies and jays, but not about magpie jays. <laughs> yeah, me neither. But it is a very beautiful word. And also, we noticed that Tristan, when he does get turned into a mouse, doesn't look exactly like a mouse because his tail is so furry. Right. It looks more like a sugar glider. It turns out he's a dormouse. A dormouse. Oh. Which is also a rodent, but not technically a mouse. Oh. So, there you go. Species questions answered. So, he's a mouse. They are in Ditchwater Sal's caravan. 
She can't see Yvain because of being cursed by Michelle Pfeiffer, whose character's name is Lamia. I do know it, or Lamia, however you say it. But, I mean, who cares? It's Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. So they hitch a ride with Dishwater South, and we get kind of a funny scene where Yvain is, like, trying to interact with her and realizes that she can't. And then, actually, I forgot about this until right now, but she has this really great line where she's like, oh, so you can't see me. Okay. Uh, you smell of pee. <laughs> 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 and then just kind of goes on this rant about all the stuff that she hates. So Tristan's a mouse. Yvain is hitching along in the back. She asks Tristan, like, hey, can you confirm if you can understand me? And he doesn't. And then she confesses her love in that beautifully edited sequence. And I did watch some commentary with the director. And he was saying, you know, usually it's bad acting. But for some reason with Claire Danes, it's not. The face, she's giving so much face. Like, her whole performance in this movie is face, face, face. And it works so well. And he was saying, you know, it's just her. She's the only person I can think of that does this. And has it be a good performance? <laughs> yeah. But I was thinking about it. I don't know. I'll have to go think about this when I watch her other films. But in this one, I think it really works because Yvain has never had to guard herself. She's been up in the right. sky and she's only been watching people. And why would she have any reason to guard her emotions? That's exactly what I was about to say. Yeah. It's kind of like wearing her heart on her sleeve, but she just wears it on her face. Yes. You know, like all of these emotions, she's feeling them intensely in real time. And they, of course, show up on her face. So they get delivered to the market town outside of Wall. He is transformed back into a person and is kind of groggy. She sort of lugs him into this hotel and he begins to recover. And then just weirdly like starts spying on her in the bath. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. I don't know how I feel about that one. That's like the one yeah. time where I felt a little like he overplayed his hand. Yes. We'll put it like that. You can see it on her face too. She's like, um, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, this is not where we are in our relationship. Right. Like, I love you. I've obviously said I love you, but please don't spy on me without my permission. But, you know, he tells her that he heard her and they have a very sweet kind of moment. It does come together quite fast. I think I'm actually stealing that language mm-hmm. from somebody. I'm trying to think of what thing I listened to where somebody phrased it that way. But basically, I agree. Like, it does kind of happen quickly, but they don't have much more time in the film. So. Well, I think that's also going to be a common theme in a lot of adventure movies that we have where these romantic or other types of relationships form. And it's kind of like the crucible idea, you know, where you're forged in some very extreme circumstances and some of the things that are kind of long plays for us. Like if we were to be dating somebody, you know, we'd see them like once a week for that's true. however it's long the before, of the you know, that's a good yeah, point. exactly. The intensity of the experience and like, it's a pressure cooker type mm-hmm. situation and it can either make diamonds or yeah, something that's not diamonds. <laughs> something else. <hard. laughs> I... What's bad that comes out of a pressure cooker? Stew. What? Bad stew. Bad <laughs> stew. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess your point for sure. <laughs> Pressure can make cracks or it can make diamonds. Sure. Yes, <laughs> there you exactly. go. And then from a film perspective, we are telling a bigger epic narrative and we do not have time to devote to several scenes of intense conversations about emotions right. in a row. So, I mean, you know, it makes sense. But in this case, I mean, you completely buy their feelings for each other. I think it does gel quickly, <laughs> we'll say. But, yeah. you know, we got to keep this thing moving. And we get that nice moment, too, of the pervy ghost prince spying on them while the others sit outside on the roof of the and called the slaughter prince. Yes. Another thing that I think adds to the reason that it came together so quickly is their openness, their willingness, their innocence, mm-hmm. you know, those things. Like when we have been hurt many times in the past, we put up those guards and it takes a long time to kind of wear them down. That's to true. Prove to your point. To somebody else that, you know, your intentions are pure, but if... They haven't been hurt. Yeah, you don't have those scars, then it creates an environment in which it can come together more quickly, I think. Yeah, because like, you know, you might say, hey, Emily, what about Victoria? But like, he never really loved Victoria, and we learn that quite quickly, and he learns that quite quickly. So both of them, it's their first love. It's their first experience of love. So sure, why not? Plus, they're both hot, so I get it. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But then, okay, in the morning, we have a bit of a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, "Eh, is it plausible that she would have misunderstood in that way? And, you know, I don't know. Maybe not. But at the same time, she is very naive in the ways of relationships. So maybe, eh, whatever. But (laughs) I'm just jumping right to a moment that I love, which is she goes to the wall. Una chases her in the big caravan. Michelle Pfeiffer is going there, too. They get there at around the same time. 
And then Michelle Pfeiffer just burns Stitchwater Sal's head right off. <laughs> and then she's like bouncing around oh, yeah. and bumping off of the wall. It is the it's funny. proverbial chicken with her head cut off yeah. type thing, yes. which I don't know if that happens with humans. I don't I really feel like we need to that. call in an expert for that. Please, no. No. We'll skip that one. No, I think that's just the magical yeah. residual. And it wouldn't be funny if her head was gushing blood. Instead, it's gushing like green flame and she's just comedically green bouncing flame. around. So it is very funny to me. But it's not very gruesome. Yeah. But then they go to the witch's castle. Production detail. They built the full interior of that castle and they rehearsed in it. So that's not like green screen or a sound stage. I mean, it, well, it's a sound stage. But they built the full inside and they did it several weeks ahead of schedule so they could do all their rehearsals in it, which I thought was cool. Yeah. It feels very full and old. And I have a great appreciation for that type of set dressing. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, these are new structures that are kind of being purpose-built for a specific movie. And to be able to make it feel old and, you know, like, this has been these witches' hideout and, you know, they've lived multiple lifetimes in it is really incredible. And in that sequence of the film, you know, one thing that you noticed is, like, she's sharpening her, we thought it was glass knife. But it's referred to in some stuff as obsidian. Which still doesn't sharpen. I mean, it's technically, like I guess it's volcanic glass, <laughs> whatever. But the point is, it doesn't yeah, sharpen I'm, like I'm, that. Yeah. But... No, it does not. The interesting thing is, that is not a film error. That's a novel error. Oh, interesting. And Gaiman actually didn't notice it until after publication. So what had happened was, he had written it as a steel weapon. And had mm -hmm. written in, I guess, the sharpening. And then he changed it to obsidian, but did not notice that you could no longer sharpen it the same way. So they kept it, I guess, just for fun. I don't know, because it makes a great sound yeah. or whatever, but it was his faux pas. If we're going to go down this path, though, of it being incorrect, I will also say that despite the book error, the movie depicts it as a honing tool, not a sharpening tool, which are different. And I am sorry now for having said that. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah. No, good to but know, it is Mason. True. Like, I will retain that for sure. So honing is about aligning the final edge of a knife. So like on a microscopic yeah. scale, you basically have... Oh, no. I'm... Okay. I'm just... <laughs> That's okay. I saw your face. I knew I'd fucked up. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's talk about it some more. <laughs> no, you could I do love, though, I will say, like, regardless of whether it's the wrong tool or whatever it does make a great sound yeah. or the sound effect that they use is fantastic so like yes it's wrong but it's so effective yeah i, I don't love care. that sound <laughs> I, I just don't care i love it so whatever one of the best scenes or sequences in this movie though is i'll call it meat puppet sethness mm -hmm. mark strong on wires pretending to be dead and still sword fighting yes i'm sure they also used stunt performers but they did use him too and there's behind the scenes footage of him doing it and it is just, it's so good. Yeah, it is. The movements are so unnatural, the way that his body, his feet drag you know, in a very creepy way. his feet drag, exactly. Oh, it's so much fun to watch. It is very, very good. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think the, like, voodoo doll, dead Mark Strong sword fight, that, for me, is a scene that is not just one of the best in this movie, but that I would say is one of my favorite fight scenes, probably, period. Yeah, I can concur with that. This was something they did intentionally. They were like, hey, listen, we've seen highly skilled fight scenes in every genre. This kid mm -hmm. just learned how to sword fight. He is fighting a dead man's corpse. Mm -hmm. We're just going to keep it super practical. So they choreographed it in a way that was just like, how would you defend yourself? And we're not going to do any extra flourishes or anything. We're just defending against dead guy. Yeah. So he defeats dead Mark Strong. Michelle Pfeiffer tricks them. They think they're getting away. Then they beat her for real because turns out now that her heart is full with love, Yvain can just explode her. What do stars do best, Emily? They shine. They shine. They shine. So she shines so hard that she blows her up. And then I love the moment of just all the ghosts clapping. Just like, oh, that's, <laughs> nice. Yeah. that's nice. We like it. We like love. Like they've been murdering each mm -hmm. other and they're just sitting there like, oh, nice. Yeah. And then we get our coronation. Tristan's dad ages, but his mom doesn't? That's a question I had. They recast Dunstan, but they did not recast Una. I'm wondering how much of that actually has to do with the magic surrounding her. Yeah. Because Dishwater Cell was able to kind of convert her into a bird. And who knows, maybe that kind of pauses the clock 
or something. So maybe she spent a lot of her life not in corporeal form and therefore not aging. I just don't know. But we don't care. We don't care. It would have been difficult to reestablish a new actress as that role, I think, later on in the film. So from the perspective of the audience, I think it makes a lot more sense to just keep that actress as Una yeah. the whole way through. Right, right. And, you know, Tristan and Yvain, they say they rule for 80 years, which is a very long time. And then I did watch a deleted scene where they're very old. But when they shot that scene that they chose not to use, he looks very old. And of course, she hasn't aged because she's mm. a star. So like, what is the lifespan of these people? Ah, so this is actually a difference between the books and the movie, I believe, where in the book, Yvain is ageless and Tristan is not. But in the movie, it says, you know, the one who possesses the heart of a star will live forever. And she gave her heart to him completely. And so, you know, they go on to reign for 80 years and then go back. But it still kind of glosses over what was that 80 years like. Why or how did they decide that at the end of that 80 year period, they were going to retire to the stars, all of that. But in the books, I believe it's portrayed as though that period comes to an end because Tristan is aging and Vane is not. One thing that you mentioned during our watch was that this was meant to be the middle thing of a trilogy. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I wonder. So I don't want to like roll that statement back. What I do want to clarify, though, is that in certain afterwards of the book, Neil Gaiman says that this is book two of a trilogy. We don't know if it's tongue in cheek. We don't know if there were actual plans to bookend this with a first and third title. It's just that we believe in Neil Gaiman's head, this universe extends on either side in some way, whether or not it's realized. So I don't want to say like, oh, this is book two and he just never got around to writing the other ones or whatever, you know, pulling a Star Wars, starting in the middle. <laughs> Nothing like that. Just that in some editions, there's an afterword that mentions that there's more to the story. I like the idea that at the very least, in Neil Gaiman's mind, there are stories that happen during that 80 years. I'm very curious yeah. about what the stories before are. I wonder if it's a Dunstan mm -hmm. and Una situation or what. Yeah, I would love more about Dunstan and Una too, because in the movie, at least, we really only get that one trip across the wall. He returns home that night, and then nine months later, accepts a baby at his front door. With such and, like, That's it. <laughs> He is, like, as a teenager, way too okay with the situation. He doesn't even ask any questions. The no, he does not. Just like, there's a baby left for you at the wall, and he just takes it and looks at it He's and like, goes in his house. Yep, that tracks. Yeah, and it turns into, like, the most adorable dad, so. Yes. The real hero of this is Dunstan Thorne. Also true. A uh, story can have multiple heroes. Don't question it. <laughs> Towards the end, though, one of the other things that we noticed is when they do use the Babylon candle to return to the stars, they're way far apart. Stars yeah. in the sky, very when you see apart. two stars, they are typically very, very far apart. Yes. Millions of light years or whatever. But we were just calling that out. Like, they could have been a binary star. They could have been something that orbits yeah. each other. But instead, they are these two points in space very far apart from each other. Okay, strictly speaking, if we're talking about, gosh, I don't know, what would it be? The astrophysics of this? They could be on the same plane. Yes. I was just going to say, like, if they were a binary star to the human eye on Earth, it would probably just look like one star, though. Correct. So that doesn't work on screen. I mean, you can detect that it's a binary star. With a telescope. Can you with a human, with that human eye? No, I don't think so with the human eye. Yeah. But even so, even if they were going to be like, look, 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 they zoom, 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 zoom very far out, and now they land still visibly separate, but really close together. Like, that's one thing. They didn't do that. They, like, yeah. flew up into the sky and then were, like, fully three inches apart on the screen or something. Mm -hmm. So the science doesn't hold up. <laughs> oh, I don't know why we're questioning that <laughs> science in a film that clearly... <laughs> has many exceptions to the yeah. science of the time. The physics of our world. <laughs> Listen, I don't know. I can't help it. Ugh, goodness. So I think that covers about what I have to say. Yeah. But would you like to share with the audience why they're going to be seeing Julian Rind Tut again soon? Yeah, I would love to. So another one of the films that we've chosen for this first season is Tomb Raider. <sighs> And we are both big fans of this, and I don't think there's much debate about whether or not it's an adventure movie. 
there will probably be some debate as to whether or not it's technically good, but it is very enjoyable and we hope that you will enjoy it with us on the next episode. And strictly speaking, it is Laura Croft's Tomb Raider, the original Correct. of the, I don't know, what now spate of films, but this would be the first Angelina Jolie one. I am very excited. This is another one that I have comfort watched many, many times. Oh, yeah. Super stoked. And I'm going to really, really try not to be a just massive dork. <laughs> no, it'll be great. Oh, another thing that we need to make sure we touch on is at the beginning of this or in the pre-viewing section, I was not sure if I would call this an adventure movie. Oh! Because in my mind, it is still a fantasy film. I will say that it is an adventure movie. Okay. Do you care to elaborate? No. <laughs> okay. All right. So Mason thinks it is an adventure movie. I have always thought it was an adventure movie. They go on the road. They are thrown into situation. I mean, I guess the one perhaps caveat is it does not fully hold up to the main character didn't intend to put themselves in situation thing. Because, like, Tristan does go off on his search for the star. But if you see it from Yvain's perspective, then she absolutely got knocked out of the sky by a giant flying necklace and goes on this journey. But I think it still is. Yeah, I, I just travel. Too. There's the, what is the way you put it? The landscape is character. Yeah. We have these amazing, like, the people they meet along the way and the skills they gain and they learn about themselves, but it's primarily an external, like we're protecting and we're not getting our hearts cut out. And, you know. Right. So, I mean... Adventure movies or the concept of adventure can be kind of nebulous. nebulous. <laughs> anyway, I don't think that any of the things that I called out as being concerns led me to say that it is not an adventure movie. Mm -hmm. So since you have all these elements that are coming into play, the quest even though it's him propelling himself on his own path, he's still going out of his comfort zone. He's expanding his world, traveling to these new places on a quest that he started himself out on. But then, of course, that quest is not at all what he expected it to be. And so there's a lot to that. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Does it make a difference to you, do you think, that all of the characters are humans? Like, if some of these people were, you know, dwarves and elves and things... Would that change that for you? No. No. Okay, cool. I was just curious. I don't think so. I guess one that I struggle with is like, would we count Lord of the Rings? Because like on the one hand, like it's so obviously an adventure. Mm -hmm. I'm going on an adventure. But if that's not high fantasy, then what is? And so then we have like how mutually exclusive are genres of film. Exactly. That's another thing that I've been thinking about in the past week is for a genre, which is really just a subset of other genres, how do you kind of think of it as crossing some threshold into adventure movie territory. And so what I think is you can have a pie chart that kind of shows the breakdown of what percentage of the movie is comedy, what percentage of the movie is horror, you know, all those things. And even then, you may not still come up with a great idea of whether or not it's an adventure film, but yeah. being able to describe that there are multitudes of ways that it can cross that boundary into adventure movies. Okay, so next week, Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. Oh, baby Daniel Craig. Yes. I called it. I called it. Back when this movie was, it was 2001, I think. I'm going to get Sybil to record a voice message and say, Emily did call it back in 2001. This boy's going to be a star. This young man is going to go far. <laughs> but I sure did. And she was like, Emily, he's an adult and we are teenagers. And I was like, I know, man, but <laughs> I see something. I see something in it. So yep. Another movie where people who are not British do British accents and people <laughs> who are British do American accents <laughs> yes. for some unknown reason. Yeah. It is never not funny to me that they're just mutually faking accents. Yes. God, there are so many good. Okay. For next week. Yeah, though. that's for next week. As far as this week. Stardust has been really, really fun. I hope that you, the audience, enjoyed going through it with us just as much as we have. And if you have, please stick around for next week. One of the best ways to do that is to subscribe to the podcast. You can also find us at theadventurelinks.com and on Instagram at theadventurelinks. We would love to hear from you. Please, please tell us what you think about this movie. If you agree about things, if you don't agree about things, who your favorite minor characters are, 
One thing we didn't adequately talk about, I think, is the costumes. I love the costuming in this movie. So just, you know, talk to us, yell at us, whatever. We're here for it. All right. Well, with that, Emily, I think we sign off. Okay, bye. No, that was dumb. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Until next time. Until next time. Hasta la vista. We are the adventurers. That sounds way too traumatic. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today on Adventurelings, your weekly dose of filmic insanity. Oh, my God. I'm going to forget. <laughs> Let's cut this out. <laughs> Pacino. Pati- oh, okay. <laughs> this is going from bad to worse. I don't know. I've lost Italian. all credibility that I didn't even have in the first place. <laughs> what is that guy's name? Julian Tut Fog Tur. Julian. I mean, I know what it is, but I'm enjoying watching Julian you struggle. Julian 